listening to Steve Wright in the afternoon. Coming up shortly, we'll have an eyewitness report on today's beheadings. And Sally will have the latest on the 300-yard tailback on London Bridge, apparently caused by the volume of crowds at today's executions. In a minute, we'll be talking to our special guest, the playwright William Shakespeare. But first, factoids. Jamie. Hamlet. The longest of Shakespeare's plays has 3,924 lines. That's amazing. Tim. Henry VI, part two, has the largest cast of any of Shakespeare's plays. Okay. So how many players are there? There are 50 named characters plus extras. It's also got the longest title. The full title is The First Part of the Contention Betwixt the Two Famous Houses of York and Lancaster. Thank you very much. With the death of the good Duke Humphrey and the banishment and death of the Duke of Suffolk. Excellent. And the tragical end of the proud Cardinal of Winchester with the notable rebellion of Jack Cade and the Duke of York's first claim unto the crown. That is quite a mouthful. The shortest play by William Shakespeare is The Comedy of Errors with 1,787 lines. We'll have some more factoids later. But now... We're very proud to have with us the celebrated playwright himself, Mr. William Shakespeare. <laughs> Will, it's great you can join us again. Steve, right glad I am to be here. <laughs> and we're delighted to have you with us. Steve, right by your side is the finest place to be. Very witty, Will. Now, you've got a new play open. Antony and Cleopatra. Antony and Cleopatra. So what's it all about? Well, Steve, it's all in the title. OK, but in the past, some of your titles have been a bit misleading. I mean, Twelfth Night didn't really tell the punters what they were in for, did it? Well, Twelfth Night, or what you will. Yes, actually, how do you choose your titles? I mean, Henry, the fourth part, two. How do you come up with that one? Well, no, that's quite an easy one, Steve. You see, we had a big hit with Henry the Fourth, part one, and we always knew we wanted to make a sequel, so the title almost wrote itself. But I'm here to talk about my new play, Antony and Cleopatra. <coughs> yes, sorry. So what's the story? Well, it tells us the scandalous romance between the Roman general. That'll be Antony. That's right, Steve. The romance between him and the Queen of Egypt. Cleopatra. Right again, Steve, right. Steve Wright <laughs> is right. I've got to ask you this, Will. As you know, there's been a lot of speculation lately as to whether or not you've actually written all these plays yourself. People have suggested that Christopher Marlowe... Look, he's been dead ten years, so I don't think he did much on this one. Or Francis Bacon. Look, anyone who suggests I don't write my own materials, a clay-brained guts, a knotty pated fool, or gr horse and greasy tallow catch. As you like it, Will. Henry IV, actually, part one. <laughs> What, what I want to know is, does the new play have a happy ending? And not really happy, no. Uh, the protagonist's blind passion leads to their downfall and death. Oh dear. Yes. Personally, I prefer your comedies. <laughs> well, yes. Well, this play, this tragedy, deals with ambition, power... It well that ends well. I think that's my favourite play. You wrote that a while back, didn't you? Uh, 1602. That had a happy ending. Indeed it did. But Antony and Cleopatra, on the other hand, deals with major themes. Love, deception... I'm very fond of Twelfth Night. <laughs> oh, what you will, thank you. Why do you even Twelfth Night gets a bit dark towards the end? What with locking Malvolio away and making him go mad? That's not very funny. Well, it made her late majesty laugh. But it's not very nice, is it? I may be wrong here, but it strikes me that compared with your earlier works, your more recent plays have become increasingly dark. Othello, King Lear, Macbeth. Does this reflect some sort of crisis in your personal life, Will? <clears throat> I don't believe so. Things all right at Stratford between you and Anne? <laughs> They're fine. <laughs> Good. I read somewhere that um, your plays have become more pessimistic since the death of the late Queen. Dear Elizabeth. And that the change in monarchy is what caused this change of outlook. Look, I'm a loyal subject to His Majesty. I'm, I'm sure nobody doubts that. May heaven protect him. Of course, hear, hear. And long live the King. Quite so, quite so. <coughs> Tell me, Will, where'd you get your ideas from? Well, I'm always careful to research my stories thoroughly. For Antony and Cleopatra, I drew extensively on Plutarch's <coughs> lives. But isn't that plagiarism? Not at all, Steve. Wrong there. <laughs> I'm sorry you've lost me. Steve Wright is wrong. It's very amusing. But take Hamlet. 
How did you come up with the idea of the prince pretending to go mad and his girlfriend drowning herself through grief? Well, it's not easy, Steve. So what's the secret? I do a lot of research. How do you research someone drowning themselves? Well, that's all down to the imagination. Are there many deaths in the new play? I'm not a great fan of blood and gore. Well, there are several battles, but only six major characters die on stage, so you should be all right on that score. Which of your plays has the most deaths in it? Uh, Timon of Athens, of course. And how many did you kill off in that one? Oh, goodness, Steve, a dozen. Fourteen, actually. I have not seen it, but it says here that Tamora, the queen of the gods, beats her teacher. Demetrius and Chiron. Oh, a wonderful scene. That's great, Will. Now, here's a question for you all. What do these words have in common? Obscene, bedroom, bloodstained, blanket, arouse, undress, excitement, remorseless, reading. Are they quotes from reviews of Antony and Cleopatra, which have been posted outside the globe? No. Nope. Jim? Most popular search terms on the globe wide web. <laughs> the globe wide web. I like that. No. Nope. Will? I don't have a clue. But it's given me ideas for three more plays. <laughs> All words that you've introduced to the English language. Oh, such remorseless excitement. How do you go about coming up with all this new vocabulary? Vocabulary? A list of words with their meanings? I never came up with such a thing. I mean, how do you go about inventing new words? I don't even noddle that I'm farting it. <laughs> now, does Anthony and Cleopatra include a play within a play? No. Oh, that's a shame. I always think two plays give you better value for money. Yeah, two for the price of one, like Midsummer Night's Dream. Or Hamlet, of course, or just about all of Taming of the Shrew. Or Pericles, or Love's Labour's Lost. But as I say, Antony and Cleopatra contains no such device. Oh, shame. Is there a dog in it? No, no dogs. I love the dog in Two Gentlemen of Verona. Crab. Funny name for a dog. Crab the dog. <laughs> Look, there are there no dogs in Antony and Cleopatra? What about identical twins? Any of them? It was great in Twelfth Night where you had a twin whose brother and sister get shipwrecked. She dresses up as a boy so convincingly that nobody can tell them apart and they don't even recognise each other when they meet. That was awesome. Awesome? Hmm, I must use that. Now, Antony and Cleopatra contains no twins, no mistaken identities, no dogs and no framing <coughs> devices. I'm sorry, Will. Framing devices? A play within a play. Ah. Anyway, who have you got starring in this one? Well, Burbage plays Antony. Richard Burbage. <laughs> he was on the show a couple of weeks back. We love him. <laughs> a brilliant tragedian. He is supreme in the role. And Cleopatra? Oh, you'll have to wait and see. Oh, and I don't want to spoil the ending, but there's an interesting appearance by a serpent. Is there? I'll say no more. Antony and Cleopatra. It opens tomorrow at the Globe. You're always so prolific, Will. What have you got planned for after this? Oh, well, I'm quite interested in the story of the Roman general Coriolanus. And will that be a comedy? I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. William Shakespeare.